Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode number 47 of the Primetime Rundown interview series powered by StreamYard right here on the Eastern Observer, I-95 Sports Network, and Zingo Television, Channel 198. We can't thank all of you enough for tuning in and making us a part of your Monday evening. Now, as we prepare for our final week of interviews right here on the Primetime Rundown interview series before the holiday break, we are very pleased to welcome the Director of Media Relations at Wagner College, Brian Morales. Brian, thank you so much for taking some time with us here tonight. Appreciate you guys having me, Ian. Uh, and we're certainly happy to have you. And if any of our viewers uh, tonight may have any questions or comments for Brian during the show, we ask that you please put them in the comment box and we'll be happy to answer them throughout the evening. Brian, first off, a very happy holidays to you, sir. Hope your holidays are going well. How have these at least last nine months of quarantine been for you? Well, happy holidays to you and your family, Ian. Uh, past nine months, you know, it's it's been an experience uh, like no other. I know every SID in the country, you know, has been saying the same thing. You know, um, it's an adjustment. It, it's been just adjusting to the way of life. Sports not happening, sports happening, cancellations, um, quarantines, you know, it, it's just like, again, it's it's been one of those chaotic moments that in history that you will never hopefully have to live through ever again. Um, but, you know, the past nine months has actually taught me different things at different points of time which has been a blessing in, in, in my life now. And looking back on the nine months, I can actually see a change in me for the better, which is, you know, most people probably can't say that, but I'm very fortunate to say that. Well, well why would that be? Well, first off, you know, quarantine happened, uh, well, the whole pandemic was happening around my birthday. Um, it's not, it hasn't been, well, it, for me, it's one of those things that it was always going to happen. Like I had a birthday party. It was a blizzard. Uh, it's your 34th birthday. Now you have a global pandemic. Uh, coming back from our road trip, I was actually with our women's basketball team. Uh, we played the top seed March 9th. That next day, we started hearing rumblings that, you know, the pandemic is coming and, you know, we, we don't know what we're going to do. That following Monday is my birthday. And sure enough, March 16th is the quote unquote official first day of the pandemic. So the world is, you know, at a standstill. What are you going to do? Are you going to go back to work? Are we going to have sports? What's going on? How do you, how do you adjust in this world? But you know what, for me and just growing up and, you know, tackling different things, I just said, you know what, take a deep breath, see what's going on. Um, lean on your family, lean on your friends right now, make sure that everybody's okay. And then start taking things as they come one step at a time and more or less you'll actually get to where you need to be with it well i would say that the last nine months have have been a very good testament um to you know how we can withstand uh so many months for all of us that work in uh collegiate sports professional sports whatever it may be the fact that especially in collegiate sports where we've had had such a long layoff no spring no basketball tournaments no nothing and then that leads right into a summer where you know we're still quarantining and we're still home so it, it, it's it's a it's a huge testament to um be able to be with, to withstand what what we've all gone through these last nine months uh, absolutely and i mean uh, for me it, it's like i said you know leaning on family was actually the best thing that could happen um you like you said we're we're as sids we're trained to just always on the go just constantly 24 7 365 almost but you know what that time off quote unquote, it served a, a purpose for me. It made me say, okay, slow down, assess the world, assess what's going on. Um, you know, for our student athletes at Wagner, it was crushing to hear that, you know, our baseball seasons, our lacrosse seasons, you know, spring seasons, fall seasons, all, all our seasons are going to be impacted, but we never knew how much to a degree it was going to be. So just, you know, sitting there that first couple of weeks, you're like, what's going on? What? How are we going to adjust? And I said, again, you know, assess the situation. Let's, you know, uh, you know, let's formulate a plan and let's see what we can do to kind of make the best of a bad experience so far. 
Well, that being said, uh, we've all, for the most part, been back on our campuses now for a few months. So um, every school's been different. Some um, some SIDs have gone back full time five days a week, especially those in the Division One landscape, like yourself, who are, are right in the thick of basketball season. Some have been a little more scattered, only going in a couple of days a week uh, with a combination of uh, working from home. Uh, what has it been for you? Um, I, I'd imagine you're in five days a week with uh, the start of basketball season. But what has it been for you thus far? Well, for me, actually, I've only been back now officially at Wagner for a month. Um, like many of our colleagues, yes, I was furloughed. But again, that gave me a, another experience to kind of see what's going on in the world and for myself, family and whatnot. But now that I've been back, like you said, we're knee deep in in NEC basketball starting this week, actually. So back to the office kind of two days a week. Uh, it was very strange. Uh, November 16th, going back and seeing my calendar actually say March, it felt like I was actually in a time war. Uh, sure. You know, the last time I was in the office, I, I was just dropping off, you know, stack crew computers and and printouts and getting ready to, you know, update, you know, the 2019 uh, 2019-20 season. And then boom, season's done. And then I come back November 16th and everything is like, wait, my chair, this is weird. Like, I, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. But, you know, just being back on campus for the for the last month has actually felt normal. Um, as normal as normal can be. Again, you know, we're all socially distant. You know, coaching staff, you know, our, my immediate staff, you know, we come in staggered days. I'll be in Tuesdays and Thursdays. And my bosses will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, our coaching staff, you know, they'll be in Monday. I'll Zoom call them Tuesday. So it's been, you know, adjusting to just different schedules and a different way of doing your your daily job. But um, we try to make the most of it and try to make it fun uh, for the most part, because, again, at the end of the day, you know, this is a job that all of us do love and enjoy doing. And mm -hmm. again, it's for our student athletes in the end. So uh, it's an adjustment. But, you know, we're getting through day by day. And like I said, you know, NEC plays literally starting but for us it will start this weekend so uh really knee deep in that and, and ready to to get the season going for us well best of luck to uh both your basketball teams on on another uh season or a start to conference play as uh, and especially your women's team as uh, adelphi my employer has a very close connection to uh, your women's basketball program as Heather Jacobs is a uh, former Adelphi head coach and Shade Jackson is a, um, a, our career leader in assists. So um, I, 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 and obviously I wish the best as well to Bashir and, uh, and the men's team as well. Absolutely. And a special shout out to Shade because it's actually her birthday today, Ian. So oh, is it I really? Know you know that. So yeah. Uh, little <laughs> no, I actually, little I actually did not. I did not. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I'm, I'm, cl I, I'm, I'm clearly not doing my job too well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's again, they, they've been, you know, it's been a, it's been a great, you know, working with them and just getting to know them. You know, again, I, I've had experience on working with the men's team, women's teams, you know, I just seeing how hard, you know, all the coaching staffs, you know, that I've been fortunate to work with, just their preparation has been just eye opening. And, you know, if I take a, a tenth of what they do and, you know, all the day, their day's work and just in, incorporate it to my way of working, it's, you know, it's a blessing. I want to go back to something you said a few seconds ago about it being a time warp. For me, I, I remember that just like anybody else, we all we all went home um, in March and uh, we're hoping that there would be some sort of substance in a spring season. And we found out that wasn't going to be the case. And um, at Adelphi, we were getting ready to host a, a, an A-team regional uh, for the for women's basketball. We were less than 24 hours to tip off before the uh, the NCAA came down with their announcement. And uh, um when I came back for the first time in September, my game notes were still on my desk, um, uh, on my uh, on my board. I still had my dates still listing when my Academical America nominations were due <laughs> from last year. So it, it, you're 100 percent right, Brian. It, it was such a time warp. It, it it felt like when you were coming back, it was like, oh, I'm, I'm back for this next day, whatever it was in March to come back to work. But unfortunately, that just wasn't the case. Um, right. I mean, it's, it's funny because, you know, we've, we've had time, like I've had times I've gone to the office and nobody's around, you know, I'm plugging away doing game notes, you know, for a game that we have on new year's Eve, but you know, this, this time coming back in November, it was nobody's on campus. I walked from my, from the parking lot in the Spiro sports center and nobody was around. Sure. It's November 16th. Usually there's a home game coming up or something's going on on campus and 
the place was actually quieter than a library. It, it was it was just so surreal to be, you know, my first day back and no, nothing is really going on. But then, you know, you know how college athletics, once it starts picking up, you know, you just go right back into the trend and, you know, you haven't lost a step. It's like riding a bike. You haven't, you know, you haven't picked it up for years. The moment you are, you're just full speed ahead. Brian, you're a born and raised Brooklynite, a born and raised Brooklyn boy. You still live um, in Brooklyn. Um, you're from and still live in the uh, Midwood area. Um, we, we always say here on the show, and, and and I think for most of us that are SIDs, that our, our love of sports doesn't start um, when we turn 18 and we go to college and we fall in love with the sports information business. It starts for us when we're kids. So can you do, can you do me the favor of really describing your childhood and what grew your love of sports as a kid? I will definitely say I've been a sports fan basically out of the womb. I mean, if there was a ball, yep, there, there it is. There's the infamous picture. Um, yeah, uh, from the stories that I've heard from different people in my family, that picture was snapped. I took the ball, put it in my mouth because probably about 10 minutes before that, I threw it at my great grandmother. <laughs> and she said, my mother to tell, told me that she, she said, this kid is going to be in sports somehow. He's going to be a pitcher. He's going to probably play for the Yankees. Um, but, yeah, my mother was like, yeah, he just, I don't know. He sees you. He sees the ball. He throws it at you. And and I don't know what I'm going to do with this kid. But, you know, th from that day forward, you know, it, my love of baseball, um, you know, I'm a diehard Yankee fan that most people know um, from, you know, I – Early days, you know, at 217 with my father, as you can see, uh, my father, who was an, you know, accomplished softball player and an accomplished baseball player in Puerto Rico. Um, he basically instilled the love of baseball to me. I mean, we would just talk for hours. And one one particular story me and my dad always crack up about now to this day, I'm 34. He still tells me and reminds me that he won a free hot dog for me at Yankee Stadium because some guys were arguing about all the retired Yankee numbers at the time. And I told my father, I was yanking at his jacket or, or just nugging at him. And I said, Dad, that guy is wrong. He's like, what do you mean? I said, Dad, there's two number eights that are retired. He only said one. He never got Bill Dickey. He said Yogi. <laughs> so my father, my father's like, you're like five. How do you know this? <laughs> so we, we still laugh about it to this day. Uh, I, I can't win him any more free hot dogs or, or anything like that. So you can buy him a hot dog though now. Yeah, we do. When we go to the ballpark, you know, a couple <laughs> hot dogs, uh, you know, a couple of sodas, you know, and just enjoy the game and just, you know, again, we, any chance that we get. We try to go to as many ball games as possible, whether it be Yankees. Uh, a couple of years back when, you know, we were actually able to go to sporting events, um, me and my father, we just went down to Texas. I mean, it was it was a planned trip. Uh, but I said, you know what, Dad? The, the Mariners are playing the Astros in Houston. Why don't we try to get tickets? We got tickets. We were staying in um, San Antonio. It's a four-hour drive. <laughs> well, we got a rental car. It's Friday. We're going to Houston. No, 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 no questions asked. We got in the car, got the tickets, went to the ball game. That was, believe it or not, Ichiro was hitting home runs and trying to audition for the home run derby. That guy can really, really stroke the ball. I mean, he never <laughs> showed it that he had the home run power, but that day in batting practice, oof, that, that was a sight. <laughs> I, I hate to stereotype here, but I feel like most of us that 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 um, work in, in in this business, we don't tend to be athletes. We tend to be um, we we don't have the athletic gene. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's the best way to put it. That we we watch sports growing up. We love going to games, and that's why we do what we do today because we want to share the stories of our student athletes. We love watching sports, and that's what this is about. But for you, you were actually an athlete in high school, weren't you? I was. I, I'm not going to say I was the varsity MVP, but <laughs> on the FDR varsity bowling team, we actually went to two straight PSAL uh, championship games. Uh, we lost because, well, I didn't bowl so well. 
So I guess, you know, that they can, everybody that's, you know, my former alums and all them, they can still blame me to this day. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was, it was interesting because, you know, I, I didn't, in high school, it was like, you know, you, you go to class, I was taking uh, college now classes to try to, you know, be a brainiac and get that college, you know, experience at 6.50 in the morning. And then all of a sudden they were like, we need somebody who, who can bowl. They, they blasted it around school. I said, you know what? I bowled when I was in the Cub Scouts. I liked it. I was okay. I guess they didn't need any real talent. But again, I said, you know what? It's my junior year. I need to put like a sport down. So I said, you know what? Let me try out for the bowling team. Sure enough, I make the bowling team. Um, and I said, we, we made it to two PSAL championships. Uh, could not help them win. Um, but again, it was just the camaraderie with the guys. And, you know, to this day, a couple of them are still friends that I call, you know, on the on on a Sunday and say, hey, have you watched the game? Or, you know, actually bowling was on the on ESPN at one time. And I said, you know what? Are you watching this? And they're like, yeah. Do you remember when we said, yes, we do. It was my fault. My bad. Sorry. A lot of, a lot of reminiscing, I'm sure. Yeah, it makes you feel old in, in, in a little bit of that degree. But you know what? Th those are always the best times to kind of just sit back and say, wow, you know, I did something like that. That was pretty cool. Can, can, can you disclose what your average might have been or do we not want to put you that on? Look it up at PSAL.org. I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it out loud. <laughs> I'm actually oh. looking at one of the trophies in my room and I'm like cringing. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's actually giving me bad vibe on that so yeah we'll move okay, on let's, from, let's, uh, let's, take, let's take away the nightmares here brian <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have to ask being from brooklyn i'm a queens boy you're a brooklyn boy i i, I gotta ask as being a brooklyn guy from midwood i mean i i think the one question i have to ask you in regards to where your favorite place to eat is i mean we could talk about the brennan and cars of the world but favorite slice of pizza is it i mean you're from midwood so are you a defara l and b guy or where's your where's your pete where's your pizza believe slice? it or not believe it or not i am not an l and b guy i'm not a defaro guy i actually there's a place in newkirk plaza uh laduca pizzeria i've been going there since i'm basically a baby um uh, our families know each other um just growing up there you know you, it's right outside the newkirk plaza train station where the d and the q are um Basically, it's just admitted to the world that you can come find me by those two trains. But, um, you know, you get off the train, either coming home from work, and there's the pizzeria. It's the neighborhood pizzeria, and it's just, you know, there's there's no other slice, I mean, for me. Um, you know, I've had pizza everywhere. I've had pizza in Chicago. I've had pizza in Texas, admittedly, uh, Connecticut. But, you know, for me, it's, it's Luduca Pizzeria. And even before the show, and it's funny that we bring it up, I actually had pizza tonight, and so <laughs> it was actually, you know, it kind of worked its way into it. So I'm, I'm really, really happy now with that that choice tonight. I think we've already mentioned more on more times in one hand that you're from Brooklyn and uh, Brooklyn's in your blood. So when you went to college, you stayed close to home and and stayed within the same borough. Uh, you went to St. Francis College in Brooklyn, and you received your bachelor's degree in communication arts. So for you. Um, the background in, in, in obtaining a career um, working in athletic communication, sports information, whatever you want to call it, was there. But was the original plan for you to work in public relations or did your heart lie elsewhere? So basically, I've always wanted to be on ESPN. That, that was my dream. And like every other sport fan, I realized very early I have the face for radio and I'm not going to gun on ESPN. I'm not going to do it. it it's, it's not for me. Behind the scenes, I'm cool. In front of the camera, and this is going back to my, we'll, we'll go a little, little further back. This goes back to the elementary school days where, you know, you had to sing in front of the glee club and things like that. Yeah, let's just say stage fright, me, not a good mix. So, <laughs> uh, so knowing that I didn't want to be on ESPN, I knew somehow I wanted to be in sports. And I kept telling my mom and my dad and anybody that would basically listen, I'm going to work in sports. I'm going to work in sports. But why don't you become a teacher? You're so great with kids. I used to work in a camp. Oh, you should go into catering. You know food. You know people. You know, I used to work at a catering hall, the Rex Manor here in Brooklyn. Uh, it just, those were great stepping stones, but I knew my heart of hearts, I was going to work in sports. So St. Francis came along because, well, we did the whole, you know, college tour and in New York. 
if you're a city kid and you don't have a car, it's the train. So you're taking these college tours by train. So it's me, mom, dad, my my older brothers. We hop on the D, get on the four train, and first stop, Fordham University, because my family's from the Bronx. Most of my family was living in the Bronx. Said, uh, Fordham's nice. I don't think it's going to be for me. Let's find something else. One of my cousins came in. Hey, you know, I got the car. Why don't we look somewhere else? I actually was around your your way and think Fivestown College. I don't know how mm -hmm. far that is. Yeah, the Dix Hills area. Yep, sure. So, they had a program at the time that caught my interest, but was it, it was audio like, engineering. No, yeah, I think it was audio engineering for for uh, and I was just like something about it. It was like I I can see myself doing it. It's behind the scenes. I don't I don't have to stand in front of a camera. Right. Okay. Yeah, you wish you were going to be on radio, right? Exactly. But then I said, you know what? It's how many hours without a car? Pass. <laughs> so. We, me, mom, dad, we just say, you know what? Sit down. I know the Brooklyn Heights area. My mother used to work at the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is knee deep in downtown Brooklyn. Said, so why not go to St. Francis? I mean, they have communications. You're you're in the area. Your mom works up the block. You know, you can kind of keep family close. You can experience what you need to. I fell in love with St. Francis, and you know what? It was the easiest decision after that. I said, this is where I'm going. Um, I'll figure out how I'm going to work in sports, but for right now, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to enroll here. So, signed the paperwork. We, you know, got got registered. First day of class, I was hooked. So, so you you got into St. Francis as you mentioned. You head down to Court Street. This is where you're going to pursue your undergraduate education, and you had your you had your mindset that that this was for you you wanted to work in sports you may ne not necessarily want it to be the talent on camera but for you you wanted to work in sports so take me through what took you um into the St. Francis athletic department I, I could tell you from my experience I had no idea before I went to college or even walked into the athletic department what a sports information director did or at that time so can you at least from, from your experience take me through what took you and how did you get involved with the athletic department at St. Francis so we start in a video production class again at St. Francis, sitting there learning Final Cut on, at the time they used to have clamshells with the VHS and then you have to cut the VHS into yep, digital. Sure. For those of you who don't know what it is, Google it because I still don't remember that part of my life, but I know that it was there and it happened. But I was sitting in class one day and then we started, you know, messing around with the cameras in the studio at St. Francis. And a classmate of mine, Nick Guerrero, comes up to me and, you know, I see, you know, I see him and we're just talking about sports, you know, just, you know, shooting the breeze. And then we started, you know, talking more and more and noticed that we actually had, you know, a connection of sports. He's like, well, you know, I do the, the women's basketball games here at St. Francis. I said, wait, we have teams, you know, like, I, I, again, junior year, I wasn't really you know, really looking to pursue the career of being in the SID business. But right. I knew I knew that ha there had to be some office that, you know, they we work in. So Nick tells me he's doing the radio with our St. Francis's AD, Irma Garcia at the time. And he's like, why don't you just come down? You know, we may use you. You like sports. You know sports. Um, let's just see where it goes. Turns out a week later, um, another classmate of mine called Coulange. Um, this is where, this is the infant stages of uh, Run BNC. Uh, we start talking about sports. Now, Carl's a big Celtics fan. I'm a Knicks fan, admittedly Knicks fan. So it's one of those things. Don't, you know, yell at me. We start talking and I'm like, okay, Carl knows basketball. Nick knows basketball. I guess they're going to be pitted together. Sure enough, they're now doing the broadcast. So they need somebody to come down there and kind of be the, like their statistician guy. Okay, I like sports. I can I can do this. They introduced me to Irma and, and Dave Genzel at the time. They said, yeah, Brian's just going to help us, you know, do some chat sheets and, you know, just keep stats for us, you know. That's when it finally clicked. That's how I was going to get my foot in the door. I was going to do the best job I can for their broadcast. Just be sight, you know, sight on scene. Here you go, guys. Here's everything that I researched on, you know, Central Connecticut. Here you go. 
they can call looking at it. They're like, this is really good. You know, we could use some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So we started, you know, just hanging out and talking and they're, they're from, from there. They actually let me be on air for a couple of times in a remote location. Uh, I think I did one report from Punxsutawney PA for Groundhog's Day. And my live cue was to tell you that the Groundhog saw his shadow and the Terriers were coming back from break. That was it. That was my big, my big little demo reel. And that was it. But it was so much fun knowing that this is what people, you know, in college and student radio was then. It was just guys getting together and just doing the broadcast doing a great job at it in its infant stage before, you know, the expansion within our conference of NEC front row. It was just so much fun to be a part of. And I said, I want, I want to be a part of this more than, you know, just once a week. So we worked out a deal and how, how we say the rest is history. I didn't really leave the athletic department. And, you know, I think they just said, you're here as long as you want to be here. Uh, the, the rest is history indeed. Um, and, and it appears to me, Brian, and, and this goes back to our, what we've said during this whole conversation thus far, is that uh, you've really liked being behind the camera. You really like digging up the stats and the information. And, and, and I have the same passion as well. And all that hard work led you to become, after you were a student assistant, what, only a year later, you were named the assistant director of media relations at St. Francis. And, and for, for most of us in this business, I feel like that working at your alma mater or going back to your alma mater at some point over the over the stages of your career just feels like it's a necessity because it, you have such an attachment to it because that's where you made memories that's where that's where your career was was your jumping off point right so you it always feels right to go home so what did it mean to you to have that opportunity to now work in a full-time role at your alma mater well you hit the nail right on the head it was it was home I mean, I just fell in love with it. You know, sitting here and just reminiscing about it, you know, most SIDs, we, you do have an opportunity at the end of your career to kind of go back home and do the last hurrah. For me, I knew it was going to be the, the last hurrah was going to come first because that could be the jumping off point where I need to go further. I mean, it was just a great opportunity. Uh, Irma Garcia and the entire athletics, you know, department, Anthony Curtin, Jim Hoffman, you know, they welcomed me in and it was, uh, it was just home. It felt right. Uh, working alongside all the coaches and, uh, and especially like Megan O'Brien was a huge help to me it, it, in my early days there, because again, we, she comes from a line of sports. Uh, we all came from this line of sports and she's like, this is what we do here. Let you know, how can I help you? you can help me and we, we all helped each other. And it just, you know, it translated into something that, you know, uh, these memories just don't go away. And, you know, to this day, I'll still Absolutely. call, I'll still call Megan. I'll still call Irma. I'll still call Anthony and say, Hey guys, just checking in. Hope all is well. Um, they're all doing well, you know, and it's just so nice to just hear from familiar faces and to reminisce on the times that we've had, because there were times in, you know, St. Francis, you know, the little school, in downtown Brooklyn that nobody's heard of. But when you saw us all together, we made sure that you heard it was St. Francis and that was us. It's not every day, Brian, that a 22 year old gets just thrust into a situation where you're going to take over at a division one role. I mean, maybe you become a graduate assistant first or you work as an intern somewhere. I mean, it's not every day that that kind of thing happens. So, um, and, and, you're going to handle the promotion as a first full-time assistant SID. You're going to handle 13 sports at a Division I school. That's not something that a lot of people can say that they started out doing in this business. So for you, how intimidating was it for you? Even though you had a comfortability there, it was your alma mater, but how intimidating was that for you? Uh, at first, it was it was daunting. I was like, I have no idea what uh, PageMaker was, how to do game notes, writing releases. I mean, I just knew I was working in college sports. It was fun. This, you know, I've seen March Madness. This is where, you know, this is where I want to be, but to, to get the responsibility of the 13 sports, my, my initial year as the assistant director, it was just, uh, you know, inspiring for me because again, you know, I've always been brought up with the heart, the, the work that you put in, 
you'll reap the benefits somehow, some way. It might not come monetarily, but it's going to come in other forms and other versions. And I've never in my life strived away from work. It seems like I've been working since, you know, 15 years old and in different jobs, you know, not just in sports, but, you know, in catering. I've worked actually in support services in at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I worked in a bookstore in college. So, you know, I, I, I tackled all these jobs sometimes at the same time. So the, the thought of working 13 sports, yes, it's intimidating for anybody, not knowing what we do on a daily basis, not knowing the skills that you needed to do about, like I said, eight, at the time, you know, page maker. Um, but just getting to get your feet wet and knowing that you're going to be promoting uh, the student athlete success, that it's not about, you know, for say you, it's about them and telling their story and telling the wins and the losses, the trials and tribulations. That was the most rewarding part for me because I got to see it on a day by day basis from different sports. Mind you, I have I love basketball, love baseball, love football. Those are my big three. But I was working with our men's soccer team, track and field, cross country, golf, uh, our women's bowling team that was nationally ranked at the time. Uh, I was even, dive, no pun intended, diving into swimming and diving at one point, <laughs> writing, writing releases for that. Again, sports that outside of bowling in that, in that aspect, I just saw it on TV. I understood what was going on, but never thought anything of it. And, you know, in the early parts, I would come home and say, Am I doing this right? You know, I would have conversation with friends and some people that I made friends with within the business. And I'm, am I doing this right? They said, listen, you, the best piece of advice all, that each of them has, has given me was you have to make it your own. You have to feel comfortable in your shoe, in your own shoes first. Then you could start doing the job. So when I started to really, you know, nitpick my own work, because again, uh, page maker, I had no understanding of at the time. This is, infancy of Adobe products. And I was doing everything off of Microsoft Word and Word Perfect because I, I was so comfortable with that and I understood that. But they said, no, you got to learn this stuff. And I said, you know what? Let me tackle this head on, see what I can do. And you know what? It just built from there. Um, to this day, I still get, you know, a couple of calls from my old timers in the NEC that you still write the, the longest game notes ever with like 57 pages of, of notes but I said, but this stems from way back when, when you knew me, that I only knew how to write it on one side of the page. Yeah. So, you know, the 13 sports was just the, the beginning of like who I was as an SID and ultimately who I'm going to become later on. We all need to start somewhere, right, Brian? And how, how funny of it that a few of those sport responsibilities today at St. Francis, Brooklyn, have been passed on now to my colleague here on the primetime rundown, Joey Jarzinka. But we won't jump off to Joey there. But <laughs> I just I thought that would be a nice a nice drop in nonetheless. But um, somehow at your age at the time and, and your experience in the business, you have to figure out a way to balance it all. And, and what were some of your keys? As we said, it was intimidating. How did you balance it all? Well, I knew that, again, it starts early on in life. You know, I was instilled that, you know, early riser, put your head down, you know, grind it out, complete the work, make sure you get everything that you have to get done, make sure you get it done right. Um, it, it, as soon as I put my head down and usually um, I, I've now learned from it, usually when I put my head down, the door was closed. I didn't want to be bothered. I didn't want to talk. You know, I just wanted to focus on doing the work and mm -hmm. just getting it done. But then I started realizing, you know, in addition to doing the work, I need to start interacting with these coaches because in order for that work to get done, I'm going to need information from them and from the student athletes. So I'm now going to have to take this step, you know, to talk to my coaches more, gain the trust of my student athletes, because again, you know, they just see me as an administrator. Mind you, I'm not that far removed from their age. I'm, I'm basically them a couple of years older. So I just graduated and they're still going to school. So it's like, okay, how do you balance that when you were classmates with them not even two years ago? Yeah, so sure now so. It, it's, again, it's now the next step of the, you know, the maturity process of me becoming the SID is fostering these relationships, which again, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, 
If you don't know how to talk, you're not going to get anything. So, <laughs> you know, you got to form relationships everywhere you go and, and talk about it. So it, 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 it felt easier when I started going back again to things in my life that I know are comfort and I thrived in and I excelled in. And anybody that can tell you, you know, and anybody who comments, they'll tell you, you know, once Brian starts talking, he's going to talk, but you're going to, you're going to learn something or you're going to say, oh, okay, I didn't see it that way. But, you know, at the end of the day, again, it's just, it, it was daunting, but again, we got, we got through what we, what we needed to get through. And I was able to say, and look back now and say, wow, I'm really proud that I actually went that step because now it's just changed my, you know, my entire way of thinking. So as your first time, excuse me. So as your first full-time role in the business, what were some of the best lessons um, you really took from that job that have translated to your success today at Wagner? Well, I, again, it's hard work pays off. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a proponent of hard work. I mean, we do at Wagner and in my time at St. Francis, we've done tremendous, tremendous stuff. Not just only, you know, through social media, but just grassroots projects that we've worked on, whether whether it be working with the community at, um, you know, the New York City Roadrunners Association at my time at St. Francis, or just going to a local school with our women's, uh, women's team at Wagner when we were on the road. It's those opportunities that I've actually seen that actually make it more rewarding. And it's those stories that need to be uh, promoted more. Uh, you know, we can all do a better job. Again, it's not about, you know, winning 100 to 50. It's about whether or not, you know, student athletes are experiencing it to the fullest. And I think that's, I think that's what's now, now more than ever, and especially the time that we're living in now, where it's, you know, it's no longer just, you know, here's the game notes, here's what Ian did yesterday. You know, what's Ian like in the classroom? What does he do? What is he like? You know, there's more of an emphasis on the student than ever before. And I think that's where we're going to start seeing the changes going forward. Oh, the human interest pieces are, are just so important. So, and very well said, Brian. So what advice would you give for someone at, at, what, at that point of your age, at 22 years old, would you give to an aspiring person that wants to be exactly where you were at that time? Open and honestly, if you really love this business, Remember, you are going to be working in this business for a long time. Uh, it's a sacrifice to to a degree. Um, for me, it, it at times it could have been it was a little bit hard because um, at 22, I was also still figuring out whether or not did I want to go to grad school? Did I want to you know have a personal life? Did I want to spend more time with my family? Um, I've missed birthdays. I've missed my parents' birthdays. I missed my niece's birthday. But luckily, you know, in the downtime that we've had in those summer months that we're not really as busy, I get to go see my family and be a part of, you know, things that are going on. And even when I have games and we're at family functions, you know, doing game notes while celebrating a birthday and you're just watching it in the corner and typing your game notes. I was so I'm so fortunate that my family and my friends have understood that, you know, this is my job. This is my career. This is my passion. You know, I, I do love my family. I do love my friends, but I love my job. I love my passion, my, my career. And this is who I am. I, I'm, I, I'm not going to be apologetic for it. I'm never going to say I'm sorry. So I think the advice I would give is to somebody that's starting in this role, you really want, you really would have to want to be in this role. Um, I'm not saying that you're not going to have the opportunity for family and for other things that you want to pursue. But it's going to be hard at times and it's going to be, you know, uh, it's going to tug at you and it's going to really play with your mind a little bit. And it, it's how you adapt to being in that position. If you're if you're ready to just, you know, all right, I've hit a wall and, I, you know, I can't deal with the coaches. I'm done. I'm out of this business. Think about it. Maybe it was just some maybe it was the way that you just came about it. Think about it. Take a step back and kind of really assess that situation and just say. Okay, I could have went at it this way. Okay, let me try it that time. I mean, you know, I've made my mistakes with coaches and you know, I'm not I'm not perfect, but you know what, at the end of the day, we can, you know, I could go to my coaches and say, "What's going on?" You know, anything that you need and you know, we'll we'll have a conversation for like 20 minutes. 
So I guess, you know, it's, do you really have the passion to be in this business? If you do, great. But remember, you are like any other job and career. You, there are going to be some sacrifices, but in the end, the rewards are just going to be leaps and bounds. And I think we could say, Brian, and, and this is where we're going to get um, go a little further in depth in uh, into your career in, at St. Francis, is your career is probably not where it is today without the help of um, your former colleague, supervisor at St. Francis, Dave Ganzel, um, who's now um, heading up the uh, sports information office at a Division three school, Washington College um, in suburban Maryland. Um, Dave came aboard at St. Francis when you were in your senior year, so you knew him as a student. But what type of role, after after all these years later, how has he played a role in your life in how your career has progressed? Dave's been great. I mean, I, I couldn't have asked for a better boss to begin my career than Dave. He was just so supportive of what I wanted to do. Whether that be to say, hey, Dave, I'll take the 13 sports and run with it. He was just so supportive, but he would always, you know, give me the the freedom to just promote those sports the way that I saw fit. Yeah, at times maybe I just, you know, ran with it a little too far. So maybe the reins didn't have to be pulled back. But again, it wasn't not in a in a negative way. It was more like be, you know, you're you're going at a hundred miles per hour. I need you to go 35. You know? <laughs> All right. So it, it, it was kind of, it was nice to know that throughout it all, um, you know, Dave had my back and I had Dave's back um, in the workplace. You know, we, we shared the same office together. We moved twice it, within the same building. Uh, we first started on the fourth floor. Then we had the, the now renowned SID suite down in the, uh, the, the Pope physical education center. So it was it was really um, a great time to just learn the craft from somebody like Dave, who's been around himself in, you know, multiple capacities and multiple professional sports. But again, it was just with his leadership and then people along the way, again, Nick Guerrero was, you know, huge for me in, in my career because we were the same age, we basically grew up in this business together. I mean, Nick is, Nick is the SID brother to me. Um, he gave me my shot when I, you know, when I started. So, you know, he, he's helped me tremendously. And then, you know, just people along the way that, you know, have, once I started moving up, we started adding to our, our little team upstairs, you know, with the likes of Patrick McCormick, Anthony Ruggiero, Rob DeVita, Joey, um, you know, and then just, you know, other producers and broadcasters that have come along the way, you know, just getting to know different people in that, in that aspect every year, it was just like, okay, what Davis told me, I'm going to tell them, here's the ball run with it. If you do get a little bit too far, I am going to say, okay, you need to come back. You're, you're going too far, but I'm not going to say no, because you need to go and just say, okay, I failed. What do I do? How do I get better? Because if you don't fail, how do you succeed? So I think that's mostly what Dave has, you know, meant to me in my career, um, starting out. So, so to, to follow up on that, as a mentor, how is he, if, if you could name one specific thing, how has he best been a mentor to you? Just always being there. Uh, again, it, it's, I can, we have, like, I spoke to him about a month ago, just because, you know, things were going a little bit crazy around in my life. And, you know, I just... Hey, Dave, how's the family? How's, you know, your nieces, nephews, everybody around? He's like, everybody's good. And we just talk, you know, mostly it's, a, it's just the talk. It's just another person to kind of bounce off what you're going through and somebody that's been in the position before. Um, but again, it's not only Dave. It's it's a lot of, you know, I, I'm very blessed to have known a lot of people in this SID field that are more like extensions of my family. because. Uh, Again, I see them more than I do see my family. Sure, but again, sure. we do know, you know, there there is that middle ground. But again, there there are people in this field that are, you know, have have really tremendously, you know, impacted my life. And you know, there are many many to uh, to choose from. You know, <laughs> uh, I have I, I'll give one to to Charles O'Brien because he's. It, it's so funny because I was working a game for him last year and. 
we were setting up the tables and one of his bosses go, hey, Charles, hey, Charles, Charles, why aren't you answering me? I'm not Charles. He was talking to me. So he thought <laughs> I was Charles because we started to look alike because I was there so often. But again, Charles has just been, again, uh, another person I can kind of talk to. Um, with Dave, he's a Met fan, so I don't talk to him too much oh. about like, a person. Yeah, I know. Well, don't hold that against him. Come on. I, I don't hold it against him, but, you know, a little bit because, you know, he, he there's, there's stories on that one, on the Yankee-Met rivalry. But, you know, me and Charles, we talk about the Yankees. We talk about the Rangers. We talk wrestling. So it's it's kind of like another brother in, in this SID field. Do you – and, and the funny thing is, is I've known you and Nick for years and um, I never knew. Um, I always knew how close you guys were. I'd always see you together at conventions, but I never knew that your relationship together uh, dated back to your time at St. Francis. Um, so do you, I guess, with Nick and and, and with Dave Ganzel, have, have a favorite memory from, from your time there? I mean, one that maybe stands out more than the rest? Well, with Dave, it was definitely... It, it was our time at the holiday uh, classic. It was St. Francis versus Davidson. Now, this was the first year um, we were invited for to play at the Garden. And I mean, I was going to the Garden for Nick games, you know, the circus when I was little. Um, but just sitting courtside and covering a game for work. And Dave was there. Um, it was just like, Okay, you made it, Brian. You, you're on the court of Madison Square Garden. Your boss is here. He's giving you, you know, you're covering this game. This is your shot. So I took it as like, I know I work for St. Francis and Dave Ganzel, but I was like, you know what? I'm sitting courtside at Madison Square Garden. I don't care who's playing. It this is this is my <laughs> shot. It's the um Mecca, right? it's the Becker. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see what the other players are saying that they don't want to come play in New York. You definitely want to come play in New York. Uh with Nick. Oof, too too many too many stories. Um, just a lot of a lot of good times, a lot of good memories. Uh, just working with him and just again, you know, just having him as some as a peer has been influential to me, and I can't thank him him enough for you know all his help. And now even more because we're more active in Cosida. we bounce ideas past one another in in that realm. Um, we talk about life. We talk about um, just dealing with the day-to-day -day stuff as being an SID. Um, even things that we want to do down the line, you know, out of the business. I mean, yes, I'm going to be 35 in March, but, you know, I'm already thinking, you know, 10 years. Where have I been in this business? But mm -hmm. what am I going to do? God forbid that the business is done with me. So we bounce those things constantly past each other. Um, again, we, uh, it, again, it goes back to other professional sports. We talk about wrestling, you know, WWE and AEW and just other, you know, promotions. And then we talk about Rangers and, you know, we, we spend time, you know, our, all of our families, you know, me and him and my other, my best, my childhood best friend, you know, it's like, we're the three amigos. So if you see one, if you see Nick, you see Brian, you see my, my best friend Squidge. We're we're there. It's you know, it, it's funny because that. Bond, so yeah, it, it's an inseparable bond that you know it, it can't it to, to be corny. It can't be broken. You know, people have tried, but you know, nobody has tried successfully. So that's a good thing. <laughs> so so let's come to present day here, Brian. It, well, not so much present day, but based on where your career is today, let's let's come present day. And in October of 2014, you left your alma mater but stayed within the NEC. You decide. I'm going to take a trip over the Verrazano Bridge every day, and you're named the assistant director of media relations where at where you're stationed today at Wagner College. So my first question to you really is is what spawned the move? Because um, you were in a comfort zone, um, working at your alma mater, working for Dave Ganzel, um, working with so many people that you have known for so many years, and and you left for what initially at least appeared somewhat to be a lateral move. You didn't. Um, become a director. You became another. You became an assistant director again. So for you, uh, what spawned the move? There was a point that it came that I was I, I, I was kind of conflicted with myself. I said, "Do am I ready to take the next step?" Now you know in this in this field, you're you're always sending resumes whenever you get a chance. 
there's always another opportunity if you think you're ready for it. Sure. Um, I've always said, and this comes from my mother and my father and just instilling in me, if you didn't put your name in the, in the hat, they're not going to call you. They're not going to just magically say, oh, Brian, you, it looks like a great name, you know, uh, come aboard. No, you need to you need to make the, the effort. So the effort is apply for the job. So there was an opening at Wagner. Um, as luck would have it, there was another opportunity in another state, actually. It was actually a, a college in Ohio. Um, so, yeah, from Brooklyn to Ohio. Okay. I imagine that would work out too successfully for you, right? Not not eight hours away. Um, <laughs> I, if they can get past the accent, we're fine. Uh, I'm, I'm good with that. But I don't know how the pizza situation is. Not, not to say that uh, Ohio doesn't have great food, but, you know, pizza at the heart, Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, so it was it, it came to a point, you know, in the decision that I had to make a choice. I, I, I was able to see the school in Ohio um, and it, it blew me away. It gave me another perspective on this SID career. And I said, can I really see myself living here? Mm -hmm. Came back to New York, talked to my friends, talked to my family. I said, you know what? If I don't hear an offer from anybody else, I'm going to take it. I mean, it, it's just, you don't, you don't know if you don't try. And, you know, again, my friends and my family mean the world to me. They've been always in my corner. They've always been supportive. Um, coincidentally enough, the Friday that I made the decision that I, that I was going to possibly take, the, that I was possibly going to take the job in Ohio, I get a call from John Beiser over at Wagner says, Brian, we want you. What's your answer? I said, what do I do? I have two jobs. <laughs> Can you I, give me 24 hours? <laughs> he, he, get, he, uh, he wanted the answer 24 hours. I said, can you please give me till Monday morning? I promise you, 7 a.m. Monday morning, I'm going to give a call, whether I accept or I decline. Um, and just all weekend, I was just wrestling with the idea. I was really conflicted. And for the first time, probably – in my life, I had a really tough decision. Do I leave my home in New York and go make a name for myself away from the, the city? Or do I stay close to home and, you know, just play play the cards at how they dealt? Luckily, um, luckily for me, I knew that at the end of the day, New York is home. This, this is my home. I'm not going to leave. Um, you, but other factors actually played into that decision for me. So the decision was already made. Uh, I'm going to Wagner. I paid a tw 850 at the time, seven years ago, one way, not two ways, tolls, not just, you know, toll is passing, but I'll pay the way I'll go to Wagner. Um, I'm still in the NEC. I'm in a conference that, you know, it's scrappy. It's gritty. They, you know, it's the underdog. Who doesn't love an underdog story? You know what? This, this sold itself. I'm staying here. And Wagner just, you know, at the time was really on the uptick. And I mean, you know, Danny Hurley just came in. They beat Pitt. You know, the, the baseball team was moving in the right direction. Everything was just trending upward. And I said, you know what? It, it's time to go. I had the discussion with Irma and, and Anthony and all my friends at St. Francis. I said, Guys, you know, it, it, it's going to be time. Um, I'm going, you know, to Wagner. They were so supportive of me. They said, well, you know, we're going to beat you every time that you come here. But I said, you know, a, fr a friendly rivalry like this, we can name it the Brian Morales Cup. And, you know, we could just go <laughs> move. We can move about our merry way. But you know what? Um, again, they were so supportive of me because they knew that I really wanted an opportunity. And they they were just so happy for me. Um so I get to Wagner. Coincidentally enough, it's October 25th, uh, 2014. Now that day kind of resonates with a lot of people in the NEC. It's media day at the Barclays Center. Oh, wow. NEC media day, Barclays Center. And now I'm the assistant director of media relations for Wagner College, not St. Francis, even though I already submitted a media guide for St. Francis and Wagner. So I'm like this. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going in there. I'm like, I don't want to see nobody. I want to just do my job and go home. Everybody that saw me, they're like, oh, this is weird. Where is this going? You know, how can we? I was like, guys, 
it's just a dub. Let, let's go. Show's got to go. But uh, it was just super cool. It was really one of those moments that in, in my career that I can actually say, you know, that's a really cool moment that you got to you got to work for two New York City based schools in the same conference. You didn't have to go far from home. Um, you have your family, you have your friends, you have your support. You've had you come from two very good programs that are still continuing to turn in the upward direction. So you know what? You left a memory at one and you can rewrite your your new story at another. What's better than that? So for so for you, it really even though you were going to another school, um, it, it wasn't like you were leaving your comfort zone because you were staying within the city. So were there any challenges that you had to face when you got to Wagner? And if so, how did you overcome them? Well, by the good blessing, again, it was 850 to go across the bridge, the Verrazano Bridge. I mean, I, it was $2 to go on the subway. I, I mean, what am I doing here? The, the, financially, this doesn't make sense. But again, it was an opportunity that I could not um, ask for at St. Francis, we, we didn't have baseball. So now I'm getting a chance to learn a new sport, um, with, within being an SID. Um, I get to go, you know, work in the, in the press box in Staten Island. And I was going to games, you know, between Brooklyn and Staten Island, because again, baseball is in my blood. So again, the opportunities just became present and, you know, it was something that I really look forward to. I tackled it. And I couldn't just ask for a better opportunity and a better a better choice at the time. Um, you know, I thank Walt Hamline. I thank Brendan Fahey um, for just giving me the opportunity to just start and, you know, take over, you know, a lineage of SIDs that have come from Wagner and have been very successful in this field. And I'm just happy to be uh, part of the team. So Wagner has, act has remained your home now for over six years. And last November... Um, and congratulations, you were promoted to your current position, which is director of media relations. So for you, all this hard work, right? So I had said to you only moments ago that it felt a little bit like a lateral move, right? You were going from one assistant director job to another. So for you, um, what was it like to know that all this hard work led to such a deserving promotion? It, it was, like you said, it was just rewarding. I mean, I, I'm not one for um, titles. I'm very appreciative. I, it, it just goes to the credit that my hard work is is speaking for itself. It's not, it, it, it's not a, a selfish initiative for me. It's a lot of hard work from people that have helped me, um, from the GA staff that I've been fortunate to work with in my six plus years to the current staff that we have now at Wagner. You know, I'm not I'm not in this position to to talk to you to tell my story without them also being behind me and just you know giving me the opportunity to speak about it and to relish in the successes that we've had. And, you know, every day it's just learning this business more and more and just having a staff that actually has that same passion with you and is ready to, to be fighting for you and with you. Um, I, I can't ask for a better, you know, a better place right now. Um, it, it's just great to know, again, that I have people that I can rely on that we're doing great things. We're promoting Wagner athletics to the best of our ability. And, you know, we're, we're really making our name out there in New York. When you made the initial move um, from St. Francis to Wagner, you really went from one longtime mentor to another and had the opportunity to work with the longtime SID at the time at Wagner, John Beiser, a, a name you had already uh, mentioned, but You've developed along the way, uh, Will Hamline, the longtime athletic director at Wagner. You've de you've developed so many longstanding relationships with other administrators, staff. Um, can you can you describe your relationship every day? What it's like with your colleagues at Wagner and what they've meant to your career? Absolutely. Again, it, it's not going to work. It, it it's not work for me. It, it's fun. It, it's a time that I can just yes, it's eight hours of really grinding and doing what you need to do. But the interactions that we have. Um, it's, it's, again, it's starting to feel like I felt at St. Francis. It's starting to feel like that, that close knit uh, family, you know, atmosphere around the athletic office. Uh, I, I, I come in, I see Walt, Walt is so full of energy. Uh, I still think he, he should be coaching somewhere as well, because this Walt has, again, he's first one in last one out running around. And I'm just like, I, I can't keep up with it. I, I can't. He's up the hill. I, I, it's just, 
it's it's refreshing to see because I don't see you know many ads you know outside my office, but I don't see many ads running up the hill, running, doing sprints. But it's always involved in every aspect of the program and always cheering the program on, which is just so great to see. Um, again, Brendan Fahey, you know, I'm uh, I, I told him a couple of years ago that I that I had the notion of kind of wanting to become an upper admin, upper admin. And he said, you know, just one day, just pop in the office, you know, sit down, you know, I'll tell you what I'm working on. And you can just shadow me for the day if you need to, just to learn what I do. And, and again, that's, that's kind of where I, where I'm leaning towards is down the line, hopefully become an AD. But again, it wouldn't be without guys like Walt and, and Brendan. Um, my, in, my internal staff, it's so, it, it's refreshing to see because between, uh, Greg Cusick, Max Rotnecker, uh, Jamal Clark, you know, these, these guys, they just work. They are workhorses and they have a tremendous ethic. Uh, I, I, it's just so rewarding to really work with them and to learn from them. You know, funny story, six years ago, Greg is actually a, in his second year as a, a GA. He's ready to graduate from Wagner. And I come in and now I'm the assistant director and he's the GA, but we're in the same office and we're starting to learn, you know, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, fast forwarding Greg and me, we work hand in hand, you know, uh, Max, the same way Max came in as a GA, he's elevated to a position that he's basically, you know, our eyes and ears and social media and, you know, does a tremendous job. Uh, Jamal Clark, it, it comes from a lineage of, video directors sure. within Wagner's GAs that have tremendously separated us from the entire NEC. And I am biased. I, I, I think we have put, you know, put forward in my six years, the, the best quality that we've done, you know, it comes from Jamal. It comes from guys like Marcus Thatcher, Brian Walsh, Bernard Abagali, you know, just getting the, the, you know, just working with these, you know, students, but I don't consider them, students or graduates, they're peers now, you know, they're, they're the life, they're the life force behind what makes Wagner successful. I'm just a small part of it. This is our success. It's, it's about what, you know, what we're producing for the student athletes, for the coaches, you know, and ultimately that's what leads to, you know, a great program and, you know, one that I'm tremendously gracious of working for. Well, what what do we what does everybody say? There, there's no I in team, right? And exactly at any Fortune 500 company, there there's there's no I in team. And um, I, I think I think you said it best there, where no matter what role you might hold, whether you're an intern or whether you're leading uh, the media relations for that de athletic department, it, um, if we don't work cohesively, we're not going to work together at all. And it's it's great to see that um, you've built that kind of culture um, over at Wagner and. And it, it's led to such a fruitful career. Um, so speaking of your career, you've had the opportunity at, Ad at um, I'm talking about Adelphi, <laughs> at, at, at Wagner um, <laughs> to, to, to oversee uh, media relations for what? Two NEC tournaments, two NIT appearances, even a first round win. Um, what, what can you say has been some of your favorite moments like that at Wagner to this point? Well, those were definitely two that stand out. Uh, the one in particular, our first NIT appearance, we we go up against St. Bonaventure, and the date will, will ring bell to a lot of people. Uh, it's March 16th. That's my birthday. I'm 32. Um, no, 30, excuse me. Uh, so we go up to St. Bonaventure. We beat them, 79-71. We're the eight seed. They're the one seed. We're going, the, the team is going absolutely bonkers. Coach Mason is just full of energy. Um, I go to him. I was like, coach, we have to do a press conference. And by the way, thank you for the birthday gift. He's like, today's your birthday. I said, yes, thank you for the win. I will never forget my 30th birthday going up to Ole in New York, beating St. Bonaventure in the NIT. And then the, the the events that transpired afterwards, we're on a flight from Niagara, uh, Niagara Falls to Nebraska. Now, again, that's the furthest up till that time for my, you know, SID career that I've been out west. So that was that was one. Um, there are many. I mean, again, it for me, 
that one sticks out because again, selfishly, it was on my birthday. It was a great birthday gift. I mean, who who gives a, a gift as a postseason win? But for me, uh, I, I think the my favorite memories have been the ones that our student athletes accomplished something more than just the wins, the losses, the championships. Um, you know, I've had you know in my six years, I've seen so many of our talented student athletes achieve their dreams, and I think that's. Uh, the number one reason why I continue to do what I do to be a small part in promoting that story, because again, that's, that's a lifetime. I mean, that sticks with you forever. And just to know that you've helped in a small part, whether it was writing a bio, sending a picture or whatever, whatever the case may be, you know, the student athletes are appreciative of anything that you do for them. And like I said, that's pretty much the highlights the highlight of my career at Wagner at St. Francis. And I, I wouldn't change that for anything. I was going to say, Brian, it's always the little things, right? Absolutely. I, I, I got to jump off on a tangent here. Cause we just got a comment and, and I want to bring it up. And the only reason I want to bring it up is because selfishly I, from, from, from an, from an appetite side need to take more trips to Staten Island because <laughs> one of our colleagues here, Patrick McCormick, who you've already mentioned from your days at St. Francis, Dropped in a comment here that Wagner also has the best game day sandwiches. So, so please, Mr. Morales, if you would be so kind as to elaborate on that. Well, we do. We have the best uh, sandwiches <laughs> in the conference. I, I can, I cannot. I, I thank Greg Cusick on this. He handles that from a, a catering company. I am not telling you which one it is. You have to just, you know, come out to a game when we have fans. Uh, you know, it, it's just great that you know we. We get treated well. The media, when they come up there, our workers get treated well. Um, but yeah, Patrick is not wrong. We do have the best sandwiches in the NEC. I'm sorry, anybody else that feels offended, but you you guys all know in the NEC what Wagner's about with food wise. <laughs> well, well, being well, working in Staten Island, I'm sure there's a lot of Italian sandwiches from from a few different places. I'm sure you can go to so a few. But you know me as as the Brooklyn boy, I I, I always have to give. Brooklyn first. Uh, there's, there's my one sandwich shop. I, I will say this one because if I don't, I can't show my face there on, uh, you know, before the Christmas order. So it's Barry's Pork Store on 65th uh, and 18th Avenue. That's my store the, that I go to since I'm little. Um, they're they're not paying me for the endorsement. I promise you. But <laughs> good sandwiches. Ask me to drop in a logo then, Brian. I, I mean, I, they didn't give me the logo in time. I would have. <laughs> So uh, I feel like this whole interview to a certain degree has has just revolved around the fact that you're from New York and, and as a lifelong New Yorker as well, uh, it, it's hard not to um, flaunt it. Uh, but um, with your positions at St. Francis and Wagner, and this goes back to saying you've never had to leave New York, what has it meant to you to always work in the city and work physically on the streets that you yourself grew up on? It, it's just it's a proud moment every day I step out of my, my, my house. I mean, I look around, you know, yes, I've gotten older, you know, people around me have gotten older, they've moved. Um, but just walking through the neighborhood, you know, just on the off day, uh, you know, I'm two blocks away from my elementary school that I went to. Um, I'm a couple of blocks from my junior high school. I went to FDR, which is on the opposite side of Brooklyn for me. And then you have St. Francis, Brooklyn. Um, I never really had to leave my neighborhood. Um, it, there is something for saying that. I, I, I mean, I just love, you know, growing up here. It's always going to be home. Even if I was to move, I mean, you know, coming back would be different. But since I don't have to have that opportunity and, and not yet, um, it's just great to just get up out of your own bed, uh, see the same course, you know, go into my garage, get my car up the same tiny blocks, but it, it, it's something special because, you know, driving up and down the streets, I remember playing football in the, in the blizzard of blizzards and thinking I was, um, let's just say Chad Pennington, because he's probably the most successful quarterback the Jets have had in a while. Um, but playing in those that's, that's, kind that's of a real far cry there, my man, <laughs> Listen, I, I was hoping you didn't call me out on it. That's why I try to do it low, but no, it's just, you know, just going in the neighborhood, when you're a neighborhood kid and then you see people that, you know, you've grown up with or 
or neighbors that have known you and your family since, you know, you're born. There's something for that. And, you know, it's always going to be home. It's always a part of me. Yeah. When I go to, you know, different, when I used to go to different, you know, uh, arenas and states, you know, people always ask, oh, you're not from here. I said, well, you're correct. You know, I try to not Brooklynese it too much, but they're like, no, you're, you're definitely from the East coast. You're definitely from New York. I actually got one time I was from Jersey and I took offense and they saw the New York attitude. Um, but then I get, but in, in the same token, I, I get, I'm sometimes from Queens and it's no slight on Queens, but I don't feel like I have that, that, you know, the, the accent from Queens. I, I feel like I have a Brooklyn accent. Well, to, to that person's credit that said, maybe you were from Jersey. What happens is, 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 is you know, as well as I do is that, when eventually, when you're from Brooklyn and you eventually decide to get married and have kids, you eventually you're supposed to migrate south. So you end up in Staten Island uh-huh. first, and then you end up in New Jersey. So you've completed, in theory, half of that by working in Staten Island. So now the rest is just to move to New Jersey at a later point in your life. Yeah, no, I'm going the other way. I'm going to <laughs> Westchester. No, forget that. No, I'm going to Westchester. We'll go, we'll go, we'll go that way. Which is funny because I spent a little time in Westchester, which was again people thought I was from Jersey, but you know it's it, it's home again. It's it's the you're never going to take Brooklyn out of me, and I'm looks like I'm never going to take uh, Brooklyn away from me. So why not just in, embrace it like I have, and, and I'm fortunate for it. On a personal note, you love New York City so much, Brian, that I, and and God bless you for it that you supposedly know. Every New York City subway stops so well that you actually took a conductor's test to work for the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Is that right? That is correct. That I did take the conductor's test. Also, I took the sanitation test right out of high school. Uh, I knew, I, I guess at an early stage in my life, I said, you know what? City jobs are going to be hard to come by. If I don't ever, ever get into the sporting the sports world, I'm going to need a job. I'm going to need something to fall back on. Um, you know, my, it, it's funny. My mother told me a story when, when she was younger, she applied to work for the post office and she actually got a call back maybe a year before she was pregnant with me. So that tells you how long of a gap that, you know, really mm-hmm. it takes for it to get a city job. But yeah, it, the funny story about the conductor test, um, I get a letter, you know, I, I'm gung ho about it. Again, I've been taking the train since I'm by myself in New York since I'm eight years old because my grandmother lived in Junction Junction Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Now, if you know Queens, I'm not going to quiz you on it, <laughs> but that's the seven train. I was going to say, that, I get- that's, uh, that's Mets land right there. That, yeah, that, that, that's another conversation for a later day. But <laughs> you. I wanted to go see my grandmother and my father worked nights. He worked at Columbia University. So again, I'm surrounded by trains because we don't have a car in New York up until I was 17. So how are you going to get around this big city? The train. So I, you know, when I was younger, my mom and my dad, you know, they would push me in the carriage. Newkirk Plaza, again, the plaza is the, the secondary home. Um, I would just go, you know, they would push me by the train and I would just be infatuated by seeing the trains move. And I know this story is going to really put a smile if my mother and father are watching, but the sound that the doors make when you're a kid is boop, boop. So that's always stuck with me for some reason. And I, and I hear it now to this day because when it's really quiet from my room, I can actually hear the F train on 18th Avenue. So it's, 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 it's more of a comfort feeling. You know, people like hearing the sound of rain, or running water or, or crickets or me, it's trains. Uh, you know, I, if I had the chance and I had to give up being an SID and they said I could do anything in this world, um, I'd be a conductor. Well, Brian, thank you so much for that, uh, trip uh, along, uh, New York city subway geography and, uh, stand clear of the closing doors, please. Um, <laughs> you beat me to, I, I was going to, I was going for it, but yep. Um, and and so has it be that you also actually have a little bit of a background in law too. I do. Uh, I, again, this is going back to my mother and my father. Uh, my mother worked, like I said, for the U.S. Attorney's Office. My dad worked in public safety at Columbia University. 
Uh, prior to that, my mother worked for customs and my dad was a security guard at the original World Trade Center. So that's oh, wow. how they met. Yeah. So again, I've seen old pictures. One, you know, the seven months that I had home, I got to actually kind of go down memory, memory lane with my mom and dad and, you know, just see some of the old pictures. And I actually saw a picture of me holding the phone at my mom's job, but it was in the old World Trade Center. And, you know, they've worked in law enforcement. You know, my uncle was a cop. Uh, he, he also served for this country. And, you know, it was just law has always been a part of the household. So it, it wasn't like, you know, it was law and sports. So I had to pick, it, it, if I had to pick one, I was going to pick sports, obviously. I don't see myself as a lawyer, even though some people still to this day say I can argue with the best of them, which I can with sports. But um, no, it, it, getting the opportunity when I was in St. Francis as a as a sophomore, I got to intern at the U.S. Attorney's Office in support services. So I got to see the day, day in and day out of what they do, which is basically like moving offices and and whatnot, but you get to talk to the lawyers on, on cases. And, you know, I have that personality and they all know that I'm, you know, Michelle's kid. So they were all very nice to me. They adopted me as they're one of their own. Um, but again, it was just an experience that like, if I wanted to pursue it, I know I could. And in a way I have kind of translated that into some sort of a law uh, purpose as I, you know, the seven months being home, said, what am I going to do with myself here? So I decided to enroll at Drexel University uh, Law for uh, NCAA compliance. Now, wow. you don't get no more law than that in college athletics. So I, I guess I guess they were right uh, at the beginning that at some point I was going to have some law, but uh, it's it's been one of those choices that I was like, you know what? It, it makes sense. So, so the family background is, is and, and, and we're skipping along here a little bit, and that's okay, mm -hmm. but that's what kind of drew you into um, going for that certification and the fact that you were also home. Correct. I mean, it, it was always something on my mind. Again, you know, how do you become, how do you work in this business? Well, you have to go into the SID office. Okay. Now you're on the road to being an SID. How do you become an, uh, an athletic director? You have to know everything about every position plus a little bit of contracts, budgeting, things of that nature. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to sit and, and, you know, just play Madden all day or binge watch on Netflix. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I have my fair share of Madden games, uh, but <laughs> not any good though. So nobody should challenge me. It's, it's pretty bad. But um, I just said, you know what? It's about that time that I just, you know, put, stop wasting it. You know, if you yeah. want to become an AD one day, what better way than just learning about compliance? And I told, um, I told my our senior woman administrator, uh, Jen Sanzavero, I told her right before this whole pandemic, I said, I'm thinking about like taking a course in compliance. Any advice? She said, Good luck. You know, I think that can suit you. And you know, I said, You know what? I'm just gonna do it. it it's one of those things. I'll never get an op another opportunity to sit home and learn another aspect of college athletics on my own because again we're so busy with game notes and games and social media when am i going to really have time to learn the ncaa manual inside and out sure. this is the perfect time um and I'm, I'm really in the two courses that i just finished it's only a five course graduate certificate but in the two courses i give uh tremendous kudos to all the compliance directors across the uh, the nation because it is hard. I mean, it is now in a in in a world a, a post pandemic world which we're trying to strive for. What is going to happen with eligibility? What's going to be you know the norm in compliance? So I think that's kind of where my where the the circles were you know circling, and I was like, why not jump in on it now? They're not going to go back to the old formula. You're going to have to adapt on the fly. Why not learn? And if you learn it and pick it up and you like it, go for it. If you don't, well, you learn something new every day. And that's not that's not something to, uh, you know, just smite your nose on. It's it's good. You learn something. 
and you said that in order to become an AD, you need to dip your hand, basically put your hand in every cookie jar that um, would be associated with your position in terms of leading an athletic department. And now you're getting your um, certification in NCAA compliance from Drexel. Um, you got your master's degree um, in business management from in, from Manhattanville. Um, so so uh, that goes back to what you were saying about spent a little time in Westchester. So you got your master's in business management. You got your MBA from Manhattanville. So you, you're checking all the boxes that are necessary for you to earn that path towards eventually becoming that athletic director that you want to be. Exactly. And, and, and again, it's everywhere along the line. And my time at Manhattanville, again, goes back to kind of Nick, Nick Guerrero. He told me he was taking a couple of courses there. And I said, what's this all about? Said, yeah, it could be fun. He was taking actually a, a, a law class, a business baseball and law. I didn't get a chance to take that class because it wasn't open, but I just fell in love with Manhattanville and just for the first time, because again, I'm, I'm a five mile radius born Brooklynite. I went to the, the elementary school down the street. Like I told you, going to Manhattanville was the first time in my life that I actually got away from the city. So, you know, being on campus, uh, just getting another, you know, experience like that was rewarding. Uh, it, I made f lifelong friends that now, you know, we talk football where, you know, most of my friends now are, are parents and I, I couldn't be so happy for them. Um, but we reminisce about our times in Manhattanville and professors that we had and crazy professors that we've had. Um, some with ties to um, college athletics. I mean, I was sitting in one of the classes and one of my professors was the former AD at Fairfield, Gene Doris. Mm -hmm. And it was so, it was, it was an interesting class, but the one, the one st quick story, we were in class one Wednesday and it was our St. Francis women's team against Fairfield's women's team at Fairfield. And I'm typing away, typing away. He stops the class and he asks me, what are you doing? I said, N sorry, I, I, I'm sorry I'm making a lot of noise, but I don't know if you know this, but our two teams are playing each other and we're beating you right now. He's like, <laughs> oh, so you're the SID at St. Francis. I said, yes. So we all, ha so me and uh, Professor Doris, we talked afterwards. And of course, the, the lineage of people that he knows and it overlapped with me because John Thurston was the coach. So we started talking about JT and it was just more, more connections and more building. But uh, ultimately I, I believe Fairfield won. Uh, and then he didn't, you know, I didn't get a, a bad grade or anything. So I, I guess it was a win-win for me, except for the game. No, no retaliation there. No, <laughs> luckily. Uh, Brian, let's transition to your, to your involvement and what's become a real grand involvement with, uh, with the governing body. Um, uh, for us in the athletic communications profession, COSIDA. Um, and you've served on the mentorship program uh, for the last four years, and you were named the, the chair of the inaugural COSIDA Mentorship Committee in 2019. How honored were you to receive an appointment like that? Uh, it, was, it was a tremendous honor. I mean, I've always, I've always felt that mentorship, you know, you need somebody in your life to point you in that right direction, whether it be parents, uh, you know, an older brother, as somebody in your field that you trust, you know, very, again, I mentioned my mentors in this field, uh, Dave Ganzel, you know, my, my peers. Uh, but you know what, just to get the, the call from, from Lori Bolig and just her telling me that, you know, would you like to serve as the inaugural chair? I said, you know what, I, I would be honored. I mean, I, I always want to help the next generation of SIDs achieve their, their, their goal, whether or not you want to stay in the business, you know, that's ultimately up to you. If I can help you get to your, your end goal, your dream, any way that I can help, I'm always going to try my hardest to help you get there. So I, I felt like the mentorship program, uh, we're now four years into it. It's just grown every year. I'm very fortunate to, uh, lead a mentorship committee, uh, which we've had for the last two years. Um, Teresa Kurtz over at the Mountain West serves as, uh, as the vice chair. You know, she brings a tremendous, tremendous uh, ideas to the table, which helps me, you know, you know, uh, send out my ideas to the group 
And we have uh, a committee of 15 SIDs that are so involved, you know, and, you know, we don't, this is not a, a paying gig. We do this because we love what we do and, ha and we want to take the torch and put it and give it to the next person to run with and make and grow. So I think when you have like-minded people with that initiative, with that spirit, I mean, it's just a tremendous honor and I'm so grateful to have a chance to serve them and uh, as their chair. By, by using the analogy you just said of passing on the torch, uh, this mentorship program has meant a lot for those that are, that are really new um, to, to our business. And a, a, as a result, you're paving the way for the, or helping to pave the way for the next generation of the leaders of our business. Um, so how re rewarding is it for you, man? Maybe this is just kind of piggybacking of what you're saying, but how rewarding is it for you to be doing that for the future of our business? Again, it, it, it's tremendous to see. I mean, we hear stories, you know, as part of the mentorship committee, we, we pair everybody off, you know, that's pretty much the the day-to-day -day part of it, but it's just about the fostering of the relationships that come from it. And sure. I think what's really helped is the establishment of the mentorship committee, because we oversee, say, a, a mentor mentee group of about eight, each person of the 15. So we're always checking in with our groups to see how they're doing, how we can help uh, facilitate and continue to foster that relationship. And, you know, sometimes it's just not, you know, it's not a, a great fit. You know, maybe you're scared to say that, you know, my mentor isn't helping me or my mentee doesn't respond to me, you know, and that's fine because we're not, we're not going to force you to be in a program like that, but we want to help you get better in, in a leadership capacity and learning the business as well. If you're new to it as a mentee, um, I've been fortunate to be a mentor in each of my years involved in this. And, you know, it's not, you know, I don't get a chance to kind of travel to where they are. You know, one of my men mentees was in Alabama and then he moved to Georgia for, for a job that he just took as a director. So I was so stoked for him that he actually got, has now gotten the chance to move up and be elevated. But again, to this day, we'll talk, you know, uh, we'll shoot each other a text. Hey, good luck on your game today. Or, you know, hey, I'm going through a rough patch. You got time to talk. Or, hey, I heard that New York is getting snow. What's that like? Um, you know, it's just something that, you know, I can, I take tremendous pride in because it's something that I have a passion for. I, I've done mm -hmm. it um, at, at pretty much every level of education. It started in high school. I was a part of a mentorship program that was actually part of a consulting group, uh, the Boston Consulting Group at the time that worked in the city off of Park Avenue. And we got to, you know, as high school students, we didn't know what we wanted to do. But there was a group of people that were working 15, 16 hours a day, but they took the time um, to take two hours out of their day and show us what they do and just help us, you know, with resume writing. Um, you know, what do you want to do in college? What do you want to pursue? And, you know, I was so fortunate to learn from them that it, it always stuck with me that if I ever was in a position where I can give back, that's how I'm going to give back. And and the stars kind of align when Lori gave, called me, but it was always it was always there and it was always trying to get out. And I remember um, my time at St. Francis, Irma Garcia told me, you know, just embrace that because you you have, you know, all the qualities that you could pave it forward. And, you know, her words stuck true to me. And, you know, I'm just so happy that, you know, I've now gotten that chance to, to do it. So, so and, and, and for myself, I've, I've been an advocate of COSADA. I've, I've been involved um, on committees with COSADA. So can you say, and, and I sure know it as well, how important it is um, for, for someone who maybe has never been to a convention, uh, doesn't have a COSIDA membership, never gotten involved with any entity um, with respect to COSIDA, how important it is to get involved with that organization? It, it goes back it, it goes back to the relationships and forming those relationships, especially if you're a new SID. I mean, Ian, I bet you, you remember your first time, you know, looking at an SID office. You probably were sure. just like me, like, re like I'm not, what, what am I doing? I can't do this. This is above, no, this is above my head. I don't want, no, bye. Getting involved at an early stage of that career, I really, I wish that there were some of the programs then
that there are now because I think it's just a tremendous benefit. Mm -hmm. um, there, it, it's not only learning from a mentor, but those mentors have mentors and people that they trust. And those people have people that they trust. And you're learning from different people, regardless of Division One, Two, Three, NAIA, Two Year, Four Year, Canada doesn't matter. We're all in it. We're all in this field together. At the end of the day, we're all doing the similar job, whether you're at UNC, Wagner, Dolphi, it doesn't matter where you're from. We're in this, you know, together. And I think if you're starting in this business, I think it's very, very useful to get involved as much as you can with COSIDA, even if it's just, you know, registering to be a part of the group, because you can know that there's a support system for you if you choose to go and uh, attain it yourself. Because again, you know, I had Nick Guerrero, I had Dave Ganzel, I've had, you know, Ira Thor at, at times. I've had people that were very close because of where I'm located. People maybe in, you know, Idaho might not have, you know, like the next person in the next town, they would have to go to like Colorado or something like that. So I've been fortunate in, you know, in this field to have people very close to me that I can literally, I can literally drive to, to Long Island and say, Hey, you know, I'm in the neighborhood, you know, you have time to catch up. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's always, just, by the way, always appreciate that. But again, <laughs> it's, it's one of those, it, it's just a rewarding feeling. And I'm, I, and I really do um, stress that if you are a, you know, new to this business, don't feel like, you know, you're overwhelmed. Yes, it can be overwhelming even to veterans and seasoned veterans. There is a support system for you there. Uh, we will help, you know, it, COSIDA helps people day in and day out. That's what they do. Uh, and, and you know, between Lori, Barb, Doug Vance, you know, uh, our, our presidents, past presidents, everybody is just so approachable. Nobody's going to say, I don't have time for you. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I've I've learned in my 10 plus years of being an SID, I can email anybody within COSIDA. Yeah, they might not know me from a hole in the wall, but they might know of somebody that knows of somebody that can help me in that particular aspect. Let's tailor the conversation back to last March and and and, and bring COVID into the fall because it's, it's just a, a part of life now. And um, at the time, your basketball seasons had already concluded, but your spring season was underway. So can, can you take me through the events uh, on the Hill at Wagner um, when the announcement came down that collegiate sports was going to stop? Sure. Like, like I mentioned earlier, we were just coming back. I was just coming back with our women's basketball team on March 9th, uh, March 10th, actually, from uh, Western PA. Um, we got back to campus and a day later, we got uh, the Northeast Conference put out a report saying, you know, a, a referee in the men's championship game has tested, you know, positive for the coronavirus. So immediately like i i sat back and i said wow we just dodged the bullet i don't know like to the scale of what because again this is the infancy stage of of the whole pandemic yeah absolutely wow, we just we just dodged the bullet we just got out of town at the right time just imagine if we stayed a day later or our bus got delayed yeah you know i don't want to sit here and say exactly. You know, absolutely yeah exactly so it's like Wow, we just all right, that's one bullet dodge for lack of a better phrase. But then the following week, now I'm in baseball season. We played nine games, nine or ten games, and I remember our baseball team going to Fordham, and Fordham said that they're not letting any fans in to the stadium. So it it again. Our minds are trained fans at fans in the stands. We're doing game notes. We're doing a full production. You know, I'm 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 expecting to see a baseball game that I know, but there's no fans. It's a bare skeleton, you know, setup. This is where it started saying this is this is very weird and very eerie. Um, I I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, speaking for me personally. I'm a I'm a little scared of what's going to happen next because it's the fear of the unknown. Absolutely. So 
So I can only imagine how student, you know, my student athletes at Wagner and across the country are thinking at the exact same moment for going down the timeline, you know, where we finally made the announcement that, you know, March Madness and, and no sport, no spring sports going forward. Um, I fell for our student athletes. I mean, that is to hear that you're, you know, as a senior, your season is done. You know, you you don't have a season, the spring season, senior season. Um, that's it. Whatever you did up to that point, that's you're done. There is no more. There is no tomorrow. Um, that's crushing. I I mean, I my I, I felt sick for a couple of days just internally. Like, yep. It, it it's just a so surreal feeling that like, you know, what do you do next? What's the next step? How do you like? Again, I become, you know, you you become the voice of the student athlete. So you're thinking from a student athlete's perspective, you're angry, you're crushed, you're hurt, you're, you know, you to a degree you maybe feel betrayed. I mean, I you have all these feelings that you probably can't explain. So if you're going through that, how do you, you know, the administrators, you know, myself included, I'm feeling for you, and now I got to feel for me. Because what do I do now for, you know, this is my job. This is my career. What's going to happen next? Because this is going to affect not just me, not just my our people at Wagner, but this is going to affect everybody in the country. What is that next step? How do you, how do you go? How do you move? Um, and so it was, you know, still, you know, while, you know, we, we're starting to, you know, claw our way back from it in certain aspects, it's still not for me, at least it's still not the same, but in the same token, it's a new challenge and a new uh, adventure to kind of tackle on. Because again, this is something that no SID before me, before you, before our predecessors has ever had to deal with. Mm -hmm. So we're in uncharted territory. So Again, I come from, you know, the background of keeping an open mind and just assessing the situation. What, how do we make this negative into a positive? How do we, how do, how do we start to heal if you want to use that phrase? And I think, you know, just in seeing what, you know, the NEC and, and the MAC and just many different conferences in the weeks and, and months that followed, just seeing how, They've become the voice of the student athletes and really using the student athletes voice to expand upon the brand of their college has really worked out in, in, in what to get through this because we're still not out of the woods yet. But again, there's some stability of normalcy that, you know, we could see a basketball game. Yeah. The benches are six feet apart. The stat crew people are six feet apart. But at the end of the day, it's still basketball. It's still they're going to get a chance to play their sport. Football in the bigger conferences have gotten the chance to play. You know, there are contingency plans, you know, I'm sure from different colleges that spring sports are going to soon follow. I mean, we saw the, the model from professional sports. We know that it can be done. Now we just have to do it, in my opinion, in a safe, a safe way for the student athletes so they can get back to some sort of normalcy. I'm I'm pretty speechless at that response, Brian, because I had a list of questions of what I wanted to ask you with respect to this pandemic, and I'm pretty sure you just checked all the boxes. So, uh, and and I think to a certain degree, you you you've even answered my next question, which was, what is your level of excitement? And I can only imagine, based on the response you just gave, for collegiate athletics returning, and especially, I mean, you were furloughed, and to be back, and for you to just be back in some sense of normalcy. I mean, like I said, to, to kick it off, NEC, you know, has been my home for the last 12 years. So now that our women's team and our men's team are going to kick off conference, you know, action, finally, yes, we have some conference, you know, teams that have already played. Um, you know, just right now, a shout out to St. Francis U for beating Pitt that we got to actually watch you know, yeah. on the outside looking in. You know, it's it's things of that nature that kind of, you know, we have a saying in the NEC, it's NEC pride. There is no bigger time right now that you're going to be prideful of that, of your fellow conferences. But for me and our staff, uh, we're really looking forward to 
our home openers this weekend. We have four, you know, scheduled for four straight games, two, two women, two men. We can't wait. I mean, we're, we're, we've been planning for months now. And I feel like every zoom call that we have, we check off the box. It's one day closer to the home opener. It's one day closer. It's coming. It's here. Guess what? Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, we're going to start to finally heal for our end. So like you said, I was, I was gone for seven months. I was, you ask anybody that knows me, I'm not the person to sit here and just, you know, twiddle my thumbs and just, you know, watch binge watch at Netflix. Yeah. It's great to do that. I was chomping at the bit to do something. I wanted to work on game notes. I wanted to do a media guide. I wanted to do stuff, but hearing somebody at the, I could not do it. I, I I was a little bit lost, which then sparked, you know, going back to school. Um, currently spending more time with my fam, you know, my immediate family, my mom, my dad, my grandmother, who lives downstairs that we kind of call each other. Um, you know, calling my brothers, calling just spending, you know, taking that time for me because again, I've been working since I'm 15 and I feel like I haven't stopped working. So the seven months of being told you can't work or you're not allowed to open my eyes to new opportunities and just to keep my mind sane, to work on different projects. Um, you know, I, I've started, you know, most people have seen on, on my personal Instagram, my thanks are my Thanksgiving story that I helped my mom and my dad. We made Thanksgiving dinner because it's always been a tradition in our family to cook that big meal. Um, now I'm starting to, to gain more of appreciation for not just eating the food, but just to help prep and, and cook the food and just be thankful for that. Um, a side note, I, I've been in the beginning stages with my mother. Um, she's always wanted to write a cookbook. And now that I've had the time, we've actually set out a, a template and, and recipes and pictures wow. and we're starting. We're starting, you know, it's not a, a full announcement, but that is our breaking news, as I know. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. But uh, it, it's something that I wanted, you know, her to do for years. I said, listen, we, you know, I can't cook uh, ramen noodles by myself before this. So seeing your recipes would always, you know, put a smile on my face. So I, I can't, you know, I can't show you how much I appreciate you, but then to help you achieve your dream. Cause you've helped me, you know, do mine. Um, and you know, for me, that's all part of like the mental health, the physical part. I've tried to walk more cause it's been seven months. So, you know, can't sit in bed all day. Can't just stay in your room. So, you know, every morning for about two hours, me and my father, we get up, we eat breakfast and we start walking. We do um, about seven miles a day. We walk from my house, our house to Coney Island Avenue, uh, Coney Island hospital and walk back. Wow. We walk to Prospect Park. Yeah. Anybody that knows me, I never used to walk. I, I, I was always take the bus, take the train, take the car. Now it's me and my dad. We get, we walk, you know, to Prospect Park. We walk to Coney Island hospital it's our t it's it's given me the appreciation during this time to actually spend more time with my family and yes it, the pandemic sucks it's affected everybody it's terrible but there is some good that has come out of it at least for me in my personal life uh i've gotten to be closer to my parents now uh more than before because again i'm always on the go on the go on the go um even when i'm here or at work, I'm I'm on the go. I was forced to actually sit and just, you know, stay and just learn, you know, relearn how to be a son, how to be, you know, a better son. Um, you know, spend time with, you know, virtually call my friends, you know, talking Facebook Messenger about the Eagles or the Giants or the Jets or um just anything that, you know, I wanted to do for seven months that I could not do because I had a game. I, I was traveling. I love being on the bus. I love traveling with the team. I love covering an event. I love the student athletes. I love promoting. I love my career. 
I'm starting to love being my personal self again, which I, I, I lost for a very long time, but I'm starting to get it back. And I'm, I, I'm learning how to now incorporate the two, which I think that if, if it wasn't for this pandemic, I would never get a chance to do. So I'm, I'm grateful that I got to work on me for once. I think, Brian, to that point, what, what, every, in everything you just said, is that this pandemic, um, to anyone that's been furloughed or or not, that that this pandemic and this time at home have, have put a lot of things for us. Um, and, and this is for anyone. This doesn't have to be for people that work in collegiate athletics. Um, that it puts a lot of things in perspective. Um, it really shows you how tight to hold on to your family and um, how to take some time for yourself. And I think the the three words that we always hear a lot in our business is work-life balance. And we need to find a way to uh, balance them both so that this way we're not, you know, we might be one week working the 80 hour work week in the office and then find a way the following week um, to balance that out by spending time with our families. Cause that's what we need. Sometimes you just need that mental break or, and, and, and this pandemic and, and with all the cases that we've seen and all the deaths that um, this, this just puts a lot of things in perspective. Um, a couple more questions here before we finish up here, uh, Brian. Um, I, I wanted to tie in um, our our Friday show, um, the Primetime Rundown, where we focus more on uh, professional sports and also tie in a lot of collegiate as well, um, that you actually have a relationship that that I never knew um, with one of our college basketball insiders on the show, J Jaden Daly, who has his uh, Daily Dose of Hoops uh, blog. So a nice little uh, uh Check mark there for Jaden, but um, how how does your relationship date back with Jaden exactly? So I was in need of a play by play guy uh, for our game against at St. Francis against Central Connecticut, and I sent out the listserv to everybody in the New York City area, and I get a an email from Jaden Daly. Uh, he comes recommended from SKU, uh, where I've heard a little bit of rumblings from St. John's, and you know I listened to his demo. I said, you know what? This kid is knowledgeable. He understands the game of basketball. Irma, Dave, uh, you got to hire Jaden for play by play. We need one. Okay. So basically <laughs> I, I got the, okay. I was like, okay, let, let's it's sink or swim time. You know, Jaden knocked it out of the park. Uh, he spent four years um, with us there at St. Francis. And then just seeing, you know, seeing him grow not only as a broadcaster but with his with his own personal uh daily dose of hoops you know the insight the insider knowledge that he has about the mac and about when at the time he was covering nec hoops as well to a degree i mean it was just it, it was just refreshing to read and and know jaden's you know background about it and i and i believe he's done a, a tremendous job mm -hmm. um we actually, it, it, I, I forget the year. So if, you know, if I'm messing up years, you know, Jaden, right, I'm right. sorry. You know, we're getting old, Ian. I'm, I'm sorry. It's it's happening. The senior moment. But we're we went 40, up. Buddy. It's Boston. okay. It's okay. We went up, we went up to Boston, uh, Chestnut Hill, for Boston College UNC. Now, everybody knows Jaden is the biggest UNC fan. So we get up there. We watch the game. He's just going nuts. I'm like this. I'm actually watching a college basketball game and I'm not statting it. <laughs> Nick, do, do you feel uncomfortable? I tell Nick at the time, I'm like, you feel uncomfortable too? He's like, yep. So I, I walked around, I, I, wa I walked around Conti Forum and I'm like, I, I can't do this. I had to go outside. I could not watch the game. I, I but, can't tell you the number of college basketball games that I've been to that I haven't been at in a working capacity. I, it, I, I, must be able to count them on one hand, Brian, in terms of like college basketball games that I've attended in a non-working capacity. I, 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 I'm, I'm in the same boat. I mean, outside of that one, I, I think right be, uh, coincidentally enough, right before the pandemic officially hit the A10, um, I was we were supposed to go, but I never got a chance to go. So it, it the the tournament kind of closed itself. So I was like. Damn, I was so close to go to my fifth game in six years, you know, not statting, not doing anything to that nature. So it, it was, you know, when we went to Boston, it was it was a cool experience. Um, you know, again, it was just buddies going for a college basketball game. I, I mean, it, it it was great. And Jaden, 
Cannon has always helped me out in a pinch. Whenever I needed a broadcaster or a PA guy, he's done most of our, he did a lot of our baseball uh, PA uh, announcing. And, you know, he did a tremendous job for us. And, and he's one of the guys that I can, you know, among many that I can really call in a pinch and, you know, not have to worry about, you know, oh, I can't, no, hey, whatever you need, I'm there. So, you know, he's he's done a tremendous job. And, you know, shout out to Jaden with Daily Dose of Hoops and, you know, continued success. As a close, Brian, to talking about the pandemic and and uh, and the results in, in our business of the pandemic and, and, and this conversation as a whole. Um, what would you say? I mean, because we've you said it yourself, you were furloughed. We, uh, we're seeing so many furloughs, so many lost jobs. And as a result, we're seeing a lot of hiring freezes. We're seeing a lot of um, professionals in our business not being retained as well, even after being furloughed. Um, what can you say, especially to someone who's aspiring in this business and and, and see and, and watching all these things unfold and 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 really getting down on themselves as to why they might not be getting a job? How could you tell them to keep their heads up about this profession? I would definitely just tell them, you know, it yeah, it, like anything else in this life, it, it's it's hard. Life is hard. There's no there's no one playbook for everything that you're gonna do. You're always gonna be thrusted into certain situations where the outcome is going to be positive, negative, indifferent. It's it, the mantra that I live, you know, instilled by me by both my parents is, you know, you make of this life what you're going to put in. So for me, you know, if you continue to to be a workhorse and you grind, don't change that about yourself, you know, especially if you're aspiring to be in this business. If you're a workhorse, be a workhorse. If you have to work on, you know, public speaking or game notes or anything to that nature, you know, just work on the little tedious stuff, but don't lose yourself in that process because the one time, the once you lose yourself, it's very, very hard to bounce back and regain that. Um, yeah. There were times that I said, you know what, I'm done being an SID. I'm done with this profession. I'm going to go working. Like I said, work in catering, make a, a cookbook, um, deliver coquito to people that I know, which is a Spanish eggnog. But, you know, it's just you put in what you want from this this career, this life, whatever you choose. It doesn't have to be, you know, sports. If you want to be a doctor, lawyer, teacher, officer, uh, anything that you want to do, just put, you know, put your head down, work hard. You know, when it gets too hard, I'm sure there is somebody in your life. There's at least one person that you could say, hey, I just can't figure it out. Can you help me? Can I just lean on you to talk it out? Because if you don't have that, I mean, yes, it's going to be even tougher. You're going to have to try to figure it out by yourself. But you know what? Don't be afraid to to reach out. And I, again, this goes back to all my friends and family, you know, whether they're listening or not, you know, they they don't know how much they've played into my life, my career. You know, every day I think about, you know, them in, in some way, shape or form. Um, if I talk to them or not, but it's one of those things that without them, I'm not here. I'm not talking to you right now, Ian. I'm not 12 years into this, you know, journey that I'm on. It, it's not what I look for. It, it's just what gets me going and it continues to get me going. And I think if you're, you, you know, if you're new to the business, reach out. Hell, if you want to reach out to me, send, drop an email. I, I, I don't delete emails. I think I still have my original email from St. Francis at one point working. You know, <laughs> I, I I can't, you know, I if I can help you, I will. If you can help me, I hope you could because I don't know everything. I, I, I'm I not going to sit here and say I do. I want to learn as much as I can. And like I said earlier, I'm in a position where I can get the torch. I got it from a lot of smarter people than me. I hope to give that torch to people like Joey, people like Patrick McCormick, you know, people that 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 have a passion for this business and want to do great things in it and, and just continue to strive every day. Well, Brian, we can't thank you enough uh, for spending just about the last two hours here with us, uh, offering your words of inspiration and uh, sharing what's what's been uh, some great career experiences with us. We We really do appreciate it. Um, and, and we can't thank you, um, our viewers, enough as well for tuning in and 
posting your comments that we've been sharing throughout the night. And, uh, and Brian, again, thank you so much uh, for coming on tonight and being a part of the show. We really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Ian. Thank you guys much appreciated. So Brian, if you don't mind just hanging out for a couple more minutes as uh, we would like to just let our fans know here on the Eastern observer, what's coming up this week here. Um, if you actually liked tonight's interview, and we we sure hope you guys did, that make sure please that you tune in tomorrow. Um, excuse me, Wednesday night, uh, as Joey will wrap up the first forty eight episodes of the Primetime Rundown interview series with an emotional conversation with one of the National Hockey League's best in the booth, the play by play man for the Detroit Red Wings, Ken Daniels, will be here to share that story this Wednesday, December sixteenth at eight p.m. right here on the Eastern Observer. Be sure to start your morning with our newest show, the Daily Wrestling News Show, with our very own Ryan Joy, every Monday through Thursday, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then, if you need more wrestling, the Essential Wrestling Podcast will be back tomorrow night, as they are every Tuesday. Al Carl, John Smith, Ryan Joy, John DeConte, and Gary Mehefi return for another week of updates and highlights, with coverage beginning at 6 p.m., and then finally, Joey, Rob, and I will be back on Friday to break down all the latest happenings in the world of sports with episode number 45 of the Primetime Rundown. That's this Friday, December 18th at 6 p.m. And all programming can also be seen on the I-95 Sports Network and Zingo Television Channel 198. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for making us a part of your Monday evening. Please be sure to continue to tune in to the Primetime Rundown interview series right here on the Eastern Observer, as well as the rest of our programming. As I mentioned, we're available for view on the I-95 Sports Network, Zingo Television Channel 198, and now available for download on Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Brian, thank you so much for being with us tonight. For my special guest, the Director of Media Relations at Wagner College, Brian Morales, I'm Ian Schreier, wishing everybody at home a very happy holiday, and we'll see you next time.